I made an effort of trying to reflect in a manner that I could try and have a concise view, as relatively concise as I can, on my perception of what leadership potential is. And I guess every book on leadership will give you a different perspective. And I think on reflecting on that, I ended up with, shall I say, seven cardinal points that I thought were pivotal. Um, the first one is, is a worldview. I, I do think that unless you have a worldview, um, it is difficult to deal with the other six steps. And to have that worldview, I think a good sense of history and a good, good sense of economics is essential. And just not to be misunderstood, I'm not therefore saying, you know, you have to go into school and study history and go and study economics. You'll be amazed at the number of self-educated people who've never really been into any tertiary institution of any sort, but have made it their business to educate themselves and end up with a coherent view of the world. Because without a coherent worldview, I don't think you can formulate anything. I don't think you can formulate a cohesive foreign policy for a country, for instance, if your worldview is disaggregated and not coherent and not composite. So I think that is very, very, very important. That's item number one. Uh, Item number two is then vision. Having had a composite worldview, what is your vision? And most enormous and fantastic achievements always start with a vision. And that vision can come in many forms. It can come as Aknotam did, for instance, who was the first pharaoh to believe in a single god which was the sun in his particular case. Radical, so you've had all these pharaoh dynasties for thousands of years, and here comes Agnotum and says, no, we are actually gonna have one God. Okay, in his particular case, it was the sun. Absolutely radical change. And the consequences of that is history lessons for years and years that we can discuss. Um, Einstein did not do an empirical experiment to come with the formula E is equal MC squared. It was vision. Now, I'm not saying he just woke up. Yes, he was a scientist uh, working the Technicon in Germany and so on. But, and I, I don't think, by the way, um, him being appointed or nominated as person of the century, you may remember year 2000, he was on Time magazine uh, as the person of the century. Personally, I fully agree with that. Here is somebody conceptually, right, through a lot of thinking, not empirical experiment, but a lot of it was insight. Yes, he had some basics to use with it, but he arrived at that formula in an intuitive manner and its vision. And I can go on and on and on and on. I mean, those who study the Bible, and I'm not pretending to be an authority by any stretch of the imagination, but will know that if Paul didn't basically take a view on reestablishing Christianity, we probably would not be sitting around here. So there's a whole series of people that have a vision that is actually cogent. It starts off with a worldview, and then you have the vision. Then I'd move on to item three. Now you've got a vision. You can have a vision and remain on your bench indefinitely and nothing will happen. You need a framework. And whether you are a politician who decides you're going to be EFF, <laughs> or you are a general who decides we need to annex this land, or you are take whatever entrepreneur that you want 
Um, who's the guy who dies virgin? Um, Branson. There is a framework there. There had to be a conceptualized framework of saying, how do I go from a vision to a framework? And that framework deals with every possible resource and how you deploy that resource within that framework in order to achieve the vision. Then in my view, I think if you go to item four, which is capability and quality of individuals. Out of everything that I have tried to do in my short life, uh, I have found that even when there may be an error in the framework, if you have the right capability and capacity from a people perspective, it really makes a big difference. You can have a poor idea and great capability and excellent people, you will eventually get there. It may go through a zigzag and you may eventually get there. You can have an absolutely fantastic vision, a flawless framework, but if your judgment of people and choice of people is poor, you achieve nothing. So, in my mind, part of that element four of capability and quality is the whole issue of, of judgment. I mean, there's somebody who I wasn't a fan of. She once said something that I actually thought, well, she's actually right on this. And that was uh, Margaret Thatcher, who I used to really detest for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> but she used to say, you know, at any day, she'd rather have somebody who's got excellent judgment than somebody who's brilliant. And, and I, I, I absolutely agree with that. The number of people that I've met whose capability is beyond question, but have got poor judgment, basically mean that the capability aspect of your framework and eventually your vision doesn't come to, to pass. Then I'd come to item five. So you've got your vision, you've got the framework, you've now employed the best people that you can, whether it's a political party, whether it's an army, whether it's a business or whatever it is, you've now amassed close to you some very capable people and you're ready to move forward. And you need to get input. Now, I honestly believe strong leaders surround themselves with absolutely strong and difficult people. And weak leaders surround themselves with weak people. And the reason is one of deeper sense of confidence and input. And personally, I believe in what they call the Socrates method, where you can sit in a boardroom or in whatever forum and you can have all the answers and you tell, you must do this simply way, you must do that. No more is, you must do that. Or you can just keep on asking questions and that's how Socrates used to behave philosophically. Make input by asking questions and you still get input but the difference is that you get genuine input from those people. And you also even get contrarian views. Once you start closing out the contrarian views, and that is the beginning of the end. I mean, taking MTN as an example, we moved from a very localized South African provincial mentality, all right? By the time I left in 2011, we had like 50,000 employees, maybe 35, 45 different nationalities. How somebody thinks from KZN is quite different from how somebody from Kabul and Afghanistan think. Right? It's a totally different culture. And for you to have 
their ability to absorb that culture and be a listening post, I think you definitely emit and amass and end up with the best sort of decisions. So that point five really is just, I just call it the Socrates method of keep on asking the questions, do the listening, as opposed to give instructions. In, depending on the manner in which you ask those questions, you effectively are giving instructions. Then I think item six, uh, on leadership is, is taking the difficult decisions. I, I do think that um, we're all human, we've all got a very strong emotional side to us, but at times you have to do some very, very, very difficult things. Uh, those who have run companies, I'm sure the time you the day that you fired the first person in your life, you went home and you couldn't sleep, right? <laughs> because you felt, you know, what an awful thing I've done. But tough decisions and difficult decisions are essentially at the core of leadership. I'm sure you've met people. They don't have to be people running companies, even in your close circle. There's some people who just don't like difficult situations, right? When they have to deal with a difficult matter, they rather run away. It's like, on five, it doesn't pitch up. <laughs> you know? Because they know that you are going to put them in a difficult situation, all right? And it's, it's human beings. And I know even very senior people that have already a lot of experience, when they have to take that difficult call to say, Morris, no, sorry, we, can't, we cannot do this. I apologize, but we cannot do this. There are some people who are just incapable of doing that. They will run around and you never see them and until you get the message through osmosis that maybe is not interested. <laughs> That's not leadership. It's how do you take those difficult decisions that might be unpopular, but as long as you are comfortable that they're well thought out, they're fair, and they're in the long-term interest of the organization, whether it be a business or political or church or whatever it is. Just have to pray for the wisdom of Solomon in those kind of calls. Uh, then I think the seventh and last aspect is the issue of fairness and integrity. Because out of everything that I've said in the first six points, um, we are not infallible. We are given at times to impulsiveness and even on occasion, a sense of the heart ruling the mind. If you weren't that, then you know, you'd be a robot. But you always, at all times, have to have this internal self-correcting mechanism that you need to try and deploy to say, have I really been fair to X, Y, Z? I have to take this decision and this in a business sense, sometimes it will affect the family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you don't take that decision lightly. Um, so a sense of fairness and of course integrity um, is absolutely the common thread that runs through everything that I've said. In the sense that whether you like it or not, you lead by example. And if you don't set the gold standard yourself, you de facto undermine the ability to say anything to anybody that is a value judgment. And we take these things for granted, but these are true. Because if you don't do that, it spreads, and it spreads like cancer. <laughs> 